a Brexit bombshell. Following Britain's vote to leave the European Union, Prime Minister David Cameron announces his resignation. And wild and weird Taiwanese pet grooming trends. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCory. This is Africa 54. Now, shockwaves of uncertainty are reverberating around the world Friday after British citizens vote to leave the European Union. The stunning news sent markets and Britain's currency on a downward spiral early Friday. And the leader of the fight to remain the EU, Prime Minister David Cameron, says he will be stepping down. Reaction from British and European Union leaders came quickly. The British people have voted to leave the European Union and their will must be respected. I would reassure those markets and investors that Britain's economy is fundamentally strong. And I would also reassure Brits living in European countries and European citizens living here that there will be no immediate changes in your circumstances. A negotiation with the European Union will need to begin under a new Prime Minister. Well, Scotland's uh, first uh, minister, Nicola Sturgeon, also weighed in Friday, saying a second Scottish independence referendum is highly likely, raising the prospect that the UK could tear itself apart after voting to leave the European Union. There are 17 million people that voted for Brexit. It's a victory for ordinary people, decent people. It's a victory against the big merchant banks, against the big businesses and against big politics. And I'm proud of everybody that had the courage in the face of all the threats, everything they were told, they had the guts to stand up and do the right thing. Well, that obviously is uh, Nigel Farage uh, of the opposition in, uh, in Britain. And, and probably want to hear also from the president of the European Union Council here. There's no hiding the fact that we wanted a different outcome of yesterday's uh, referendum. I am fully aware of how serious or even dramatic this moment is uh, politically. And there is no way of predicting all the political consequences of this event, especially for the UK. I want to reassure everyone that we are prepared also for this negative scenario. Now for the latest on Thursday's shocking and historic vote, Henry Ridgewell joins us live via Skype from Brussels, Belgium, the headquarters of the European Union. Henry, welcome. Good evening, Vincent. Good evening. You've been there. Now give us a reaction that you've uh, seen on the streets of Brussels from both uh, the Brits who live there and uh, other citizens from other countries of the European Union. I think citizens of all nationalities here are shell-shocked, despite the fact that the polls have been very close for several weeks, that that likelihood of Britain leaving the EU was always there. There's been an element of denial here in Brussels that it was going to happen. It's been business as usual for several weeks. And when people woke up this morning here in Brussels to find that Britain was leaving the EU, a sense of, of disbelief. Uh, immediately, the machinery of the European Union, the institutions, held crisis meetings uh, and mid-morning we had statements from uh, the presidents of those various institutions presenting a united front saying that they very much regretted Britain's move uh, but that they would deal properly along the lines of the treaties that govern the workings of the European Union with Britain's exit. Uh, they also said they want Britain to uh, move quickly to start that process of leaving the European Union. They don't want months of uncertainty. Uh, that goes against what Britain wants to do, which is to wait several months to begin that process. So already the tensions are coming to the surface uh, even before the negotiations and the talks have begun here in Brussels about Britain leaving. And, you know, yesterday and the day before, we talked about a lack of uh, contingency plans or at least discussions around that, partially because people are in denial. Now it looks like that has to kick in quickly, right? 
Exactly right. Uh, there are treaties and clauses to follow, but they don't detail exactly the order in which things should be done or the way in which it should be done or, or which institution should be talking to which government department. All that has to be still worked out. Uh, and so while the, the referendum did deliver the result and a result that shocked many around the world, it's just the beginning of a, a very long process which will take a minimum of two years, which is uh, the <clears throat> maximum mandated by the uh, Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty. Uh, but it could, if Britain delays uh, instigating that, treat, that article, then it could take much longer. And then it will have to negotiate new trade deals, uh, not only with Europe, but of course with the rest of the world as well, with countries in Africa which have existing trade deals with the European Union and therefore with Britain. All of those trade deals will have to be renegotiated. So there are <clears throat> reams and reams of laws and treaties and paperwork which will have to be torn up and rewritten. The task facing the civil servants and the bureaucrats, both here in Brussels and in London, and in other capitals around the world cannot be understated. Indeed, in numbers. Uh, tell me, are there concerns uh, over perhaps other European Union members looking at Britain's uh, vote as uh, perhaps uh, something that could happen in their own countries? There are grave concerns over that in Brussels. Already, uh, the anti-EU parties in countries like the Netherlands, uh, with the Freedom Party of Heert Wilders, uh, and the Front National, the National Front in, in France under Marine Le Pen, uh, and uh, the Lega Nord in, in Italy, have all called for their own referenda on their membership of the European well, Union. Britain has always been uh, a Eurosceptic nation, and it was always among those I suppose, on the, on the fringe and, and, and more likely to leave if any nation was going to do so. Other countries, I think, are, are less inclined to do so. They may be very critical of the European Union, like the Netherlands, like Denmark. Whether they would actually go the full right. distance and have a referendum and then whether the people would vote to leave, uh, I think that's probably unlikely at the moment. Okay. But this could set in train something which may be unstoppable. Well, Henry, thank you very much for your reporting. Good to be with you. Henry Ridgewell reporting live via Skype from Brussels. Now, Britain's historic decision to break away from the EU sent global markets into a free fall. Markets from Tokyo to Europe, to Europe tumbled Friday under the uncertainty uh, the ballot brings. Now, meanwhile, regional leaders in Asia took steps to limit the possible fallout. VOS Bill Eyed reports from Beijing. Markets in Asia plunged Friday as the reality of Britain's exit from the EU set in. Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index tumbled more than 4% and Tokyo had to halt trading when shares slipped nearly 8%. Bloomberg estimates that shares shed nearly $700 billion in value during trading. Currencies were caught up in the carnage as well. Britain's pound had its worst fall on record, tumbling to a 31-year low. South Korea held an emergency meeting to limit any fallout from the ballot. The Japanese yen strengthened against the U.S. dollar. The stability of the foreign exchange markets is of utmost importance for global growth, but currently the foreign exchange markets are extremely nervous. Analysts say foreign currencies are likely to see the most turbulence as investors look for safe havens. As stocks slid, the price of gold soared Friday. Not all had a dim outlook. I think the economic impact in the short term is limited. Now, people are worried about the financial shock. Uh, you know, the, uh, would the London as a financial cent center be interrupted? I seriously doubt that. Markets, however, may take more time to be convinced. Bill Eyde, VOA News, Beijing. Well, joining us now live from New York with more on the impact to global markets is Africa 54 business correspondent Jill Malandrino. Jill, welcome. Now, did Britain <laughs> just blow up Europe? Can you give us some clarity on all, what all this means now? 
It's been a long 24 hours for us market correspondents. Brexit certainly shocked the global stock, bond and currency markets. The Leave vote puts the UK on track to end its 43-year membership in the EU. And now political leaders are scrambling to make the next move. The most obvious reaction was an 8% move in the pound, plunging to its lowest level since 1985. We also saw broad declines in the metals and energy sectors, but the financials were hit hard the most, especially the European banks like Deutsche Bank, Credit Suisse, UBS, and Barclays. Gold, which is viewed as a safe haven asset, surged more than 5%. Now, Jill, is it all doom and gloom for the financial markets, though? Let's put this into perspective a bit, because the initial move is always an overreaction. The Dow was up 500 points in the last five days and was down roughly the same amount in the pre-market. So basically, we are where we were just last Thursday. A 500-point move in the Dow in just five days is tremendous. S&P 500 futures touched an overnight low of 1999, down from the overnight high of 2119. Prior to the Brexit vote, the S&P 500 just yesterday was just under 2% away from making new all-time highs. So while the overnight moves seem really exaggerated, you have to take into consideration the levels we are coming in from. In fact, I think there are some excellent buying opportunities out there now. So what happens now? Prime Minister Cameron has to notify the European Council. Next is a two-year negotiating process to work out the details of the exit, but I suspect that it will go on much longer than that. Recall that the UK has its own currency and central bank and essentially has been operating on its own for years anyway. Now, uh, should investors be concerned about their money? I would expect the heavy selling pressure to ease early next week, assuming nothing out of the ordinary occurs over the weekend. Foreign uncertainty could even potentially send investors to U.S. markets. I want to urge investors not to panic. This is not remotely close to 1987, as some in the media have suggested. Not to sound like a broken record, but the one thing markets do not like is uncertainty. And there's a lot of unknowns out there now, so it will take a lot of time and it will take a lot of patience for this to play out. For retail investors, don't let isolated events dictate your investment style, but rather focus on the long-term averages. Look at it this way. The S&P 500 is up almost 300% since the lows of the financial crisis. That's a move I would not want to miss out on. Well, Jill, thank you very much for your analysis. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, Africa 54 business correspondent Jill Malandrino reporting live from New York. Now, so what will, be, will uh, the British vote to exit the EU mean for Africa? For some perspective, Ms. Elizabeth uh, Sidropoulos, Chief Executive of South African Institute of International Affairs, joins me live via Skype from Johannesburg. Good evening, Elizabeth. Hi, Victor. Now, a uh, question here. What has been the immediate reaction in South Africa to this vote? Well, earlier today, um, uh, our finance minister, Pravin Gordon, uh, spoke, uh, spoke to the media after a meeting with the South African Reserve Bank, uh, clearly uh, on, uh, to, to discuss the, the decision, which I think has shocked all of us. Um, I think we were all hoping that it, it, would go, it would go the other way. I think he emphasized the importance of uh, the strong links between the EU, the UK and, and, and South Africa, but also noted that our financial sector in particular was very resilient uh, and was able to withstand uh, the, the, current, the, the volatility, the overall financial volatility, which, of course, we, um, we experienced during the course uh, of the day. There was also a statement from, from the presidency, uh, pretty much uh, mirroring, mirroring the points that were raised by, uh, by the finance minister. And, of course, our markets, have, uh, our markets and our currency have, uh, have all, uh, all experienced uh, red. So uh, the currency at one point had lost um, something like 9% uh, mm -hmm. compared to the close the previous day. I think it, it, it came back to uh, a little bit, it pulled back a little bit. I think it lost overall um, uh, the average, I think, by the end of the day was about 5% yep. uh, against the dollar. The, the uh, all-share index uh, lost uh, just under 4%. 
-hmm. If I just look at the at the figures now from the stock exchange uh, since the close, uh, the top 40 were down 4%, the financial 15 down 5.5, industrial 25 down 3.5, mm -hmm. resource and, 10 down 2.75. Of course, a little less because of the gold. Now, beyond this very immediate reaction from the markets, what wider implications does this have for South Africa, which particularly has a lot of exposure or a big exposure to the European market? Well, I think the first point uh, to make in that in that regard is that, of course, the European Union as a single market is our single largest trading partner. We often talk about China being our largest trading partner, but that would be if you were to disaggregate uh, the European Union into its component states. And certainly from a trade perspective, that should not be the case. As far as the UK is concerned, equally important uh, from a trade perspective, one-fifth of our exports to the um, European Union actually go to uh, go to the UK. It's also very it's also a very significant investor uh, in South Africa, and of course, uh, many South African companies are also invested and and uh, um, are, are uh, on the on, on the London London Stock Exchange. Very important from a direct investment perspective, but also very important from a portfolio investment perspective, which is not always great for our rand because portfolio flows come and go. Uh, but certainly. Um, uh, 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 one of our our key trading and investment partners, and so the the fact that post uh, this vote, uh, the UK will now have to begin the process of negotiating uh, its its exit from the European Union means that also from our perspective, we also have to. Uh, mm -hmm. Think about uh, how we renegotiate Thank our particularly our trade relationship. Thank you very much, Ms. Sidropoulos. We do appreciate your insights. Right. All right, that's uh, Elizabeth uh, Sideropoulos, uh, was the chief executive of South African Institute of International Affairs. She joins us live via Skype from Johannesburg. Well, entrepreneurs from around the world are attending a global summit, sharing ideas on ways to improve education, increase infrastructure, and alleviate poverty. U.S. President Barack Obama leads the U.S. delegation at the 2016 Global Entrepreneurs Hip, uh, Hip Summit, rather Entrepreneurship Summit in California's Silicon Valley. The three-day conference wraps up today. Viewers Deborah Block has more. The summit is tackling global challenges and deepening business ties around the world. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry, who spoke at the meeting, says creating economic opportunity and the potential for political stability Richard, go you, hand in so hand. Much. The marketplace is moving faster. Ideas are moving faster. And we simply will not be able to keep up to solve the problems before us without the talent and contributions of this generation of entrepreneurs of all of you. Like entrepreneur Elsa Marie De Silva from India, who began Safe City, an online platform that collects crowdsourced data to help make cities safer by encouraging equal access to public spaces for everyone, especially women. And we've seen a lot of uh, good work where police have changed their beat patrol timings or increased patrolling. Municipal authorities have fixed in infrastructure like street lighting. American Hobby Berry began a jewelry business in Africa called Fulaba, which helps provide jobs. It's all handmade. All the materials are sourced from Guinea, West Africa. We work with local artisans there, and we're working on building a team. A Malaysian startup called Haiji Energy helps to reduce the use of firewood and charcoal by converting agricultural waste into smokeless briquettes that produces cleaner energy. Jackie Yap started it. I want to inspire more young people to actually explore into entrepreneurship at really young age and actually go for all the, all the problems that you will be facing. American entrepreneur Steve Case says entrepreneurship is especially difficult in countries without good infrastructure. Some of the entrepreneurs from different parts of the world have some extra challenges and we just need to be helpful where we can be helpful and helping them kind of take the, take the next step. Deborah Block, VOA News, Washington. Well, for more on the 2016 Global Entrepreneurs Entrepreneurship Summit, viewers Elizabeth Lee joins me live via Skype from Palo Alto. Hello, Elizabeth. Hi, how are you? Fine here. Uh, a very exciting time over there. Tell us, well, you've been talking to a number of people there. What are they telling you is the value of this summit to them? 
Well, for a lot of these entrepreneurs, it, the value is really networking. And they said it's very, very inspirational to be coming to a place where uh, they're meeting like-minded people and people from around the world. They realize, for example, a lot of them come from perhaps some of the more rural parts of Africa, and they may be the only entrepreneur there, or uh, they feel quite alone. But then when they come here, they realize there's a lot of people who share the same passions and, and beliefs and owning their own business and the difference they can make in their community. And they find that very inspiring. They're also going to a lot of these sessions uh, where people from the other side, the venture capitalists um, who would be investing in some of these entrepreneurs are giving them advice on what to do, what not to do. So they are really getting a lot out of this. They also realize that even though there may be a lot of cultural differences between um, people from the continent and people, say, from Southeast Asia or the Middle East, but they all share a lot of common threads as far as the types of challenges that they face as entrepreneurs. Um, one common thread is just um, to have people around them believe in them. A lot of them um, come from families who say, we want you to have a more reliable, steady job instead of taking the risk of being an entrepreneur. Yeah. And, uh, and they're really fighting that to really, they have to believe in themselves in order to go against a lot of the naysayers. Now, now Elizabeth, talk about uh, believing themselves and uh, finding things to do that bring solutions to the communities. You spoke to a particularly interesting person. Can you share with us that account? Yes, so socially conscious um, entrepreneurship, it seems to be a common thread among a lot of these people. A lot of them are millennials. And the other thing is I spoke to a person who is um, starting um, an initiative that wants to invest, especially in this region, from North Africa all the way through the Middle East, Central Asia, and into Asia. And he says this is a very oil and gas re rich region, and uh, but with the gas prices falling, we're going to have a lot of unemployment. And with that, he believes a lot of people will start either go getting very depressed or joining terrorists and extremist groups. And he wants to invest in this region and really cultivating the idea of entrepreneurship to give them a different outlet. And in turn, once you have businesses that are being built, it's going to provide more jobs and it's going to give people hope. And it's a very positive trickle-down effect that he hopes to mm -hmm. achieve within the next the, 10 years. Well, Elizabeth, quite a lot of benefit from that summit. Thank you very much for your reporting. Thank you. Viewers Elizabeth Lee reporting live via Skype from Palo Alto in California. Well, it's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54. Taiwan's pets get out of the box makeovers. We'll be right back. If you've just joined us, I'm Maria Diallo, and here is a quick recap of today's headlines. In Malawi, citizens protest attacks on people with albinism and call for tougher punishments for attackers. In Zimbabwe, citizens face limited cash withdrawals and are forced to use foreign currency, which may be worth less following the Brexit result. In Ethiopia, Eritrean refugees hold demonstrations in the country to condemn human rights abuses by their government at home. Finally, in South Africa, five people are dead following riots in the capital over the ruling party's choice of mayoral candidate. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Welcome back to Africa 54. Here's what's trending. We begin in Taiwan, where pets are getting exotic makeovers. An unusual pet salon in southern Taiwan attracts customers by providing fur grooming services that range from cute to bizarre. Those include trimming the back fur of pets into the shape of Hello Kitty, a teddy bear, and something the salon calls Stegosaurus spine. Now, the owner of the salon says the dino design came from their customers 
who wanted something different to the usual full body trim. Although the pet salon only opened its doors for the first time in September last year, it has already built a loyal customer base. While staying in China, these kids are enjoying the latest activity park to open on the outskirts of Beijing. The owners hope it will kick off a new craze for trampolining. The fitness industry in China has been growing since the government implemented a national fitness program in 2011 with the aim of encouraging people of all ages to have a healthier lifestyle. The idea of a national fitness program started as early as 1995, but it wasn't until 2011 that the country started building facilities on a massive scale. Newly built fitness areas have even sprung up in community parks across the country where senior citizens sweat it out alongside young people. From 2010 to 2015, the Chinese health and fitness industry grew by almost 14%. Well, and finally, the mining industry in Australia is going through a high-tech revolution. As mining and resource companies turn to technology to cut costs, some are even reinventing themselves as tech stocks. This transformation is driving a new wave of jobs with homegrown startups and entrepreneurs developing innovative ways to help companies slash spending. Millennial gamers have created a virtual reality to help mining and resource companies save time and money. One startup has developed a device that uses high-tech sensors that make drilling up to 90% more accurate. Australia's big resource companies are testing out the interactive worlds to remotely train workers on safety and mine, mine site procedures. And that is what is trending today. Well, and that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. We leave you now with Imik Simik. That's a song by Hindi Zahra, a Franco-Moroccan singer. Good night. I come from jazz music and world music, mostly. And uh, now I'm touring my second album uh, called Homeland, here in uh, France, in Montpellier, with the Festival Arabesque. Simic, Simic, a force for force. When do we know it enough to our Simic, Simic, a force for force. Welcome to English in a Minute. Sometimes it can be hard to hold on to things. But what does this expression mean? Get a grip. Oh no. I can't believe I did not set my alarm last night. Now I'm going to be late for work, my boss will yell at me, and I will probably get fired. Jonathan, Jonathan, get a grip. You will not be fired. Just calm down and explain what happened to your boss. Okay, okay, I guess you're right. I need to get a grip. To get a grip means to make an effort to control your emotions. When you have a grip on something, you are able to be fully in control. Get a grip 
can also mean to get a better understanding of something. And that's English in a Minute.